Well, you know, we've been using uh, indicators here, Pete, and as uh, we all know, you're on Team USA, and it was Slovakia uh, uh, 2004, right. and you did the best of the uh, U.S. team, and it was NIM fishing. Absolutely. But it was NIM fishing without an indicator. Yep, uh, you're not allowed to use an indicator, and personally, I would, wouldn't choose to use one in, in those situations. Why, you get more fish? I just think you have more options without an indicator. You, you, you have more uh, presentation options without an indicator. I notice right now you've set up some European nymphing. You've got uh, uh, an anchor nymph, a heavy nymph, yep. and, and you've got another nymph up here. Mm -hmm. and these are really heavy. In fact, you could add several nymphs on this, couldn't you? Yeah, I, I, I often fish with three nymphs in the competitions in Europe. But that creates a oh, casting you, nightmare. You better know what you're doing as far as how you're gonna, you know, basically you're doing a lot of lobbing of, mm -hmm. of cask. It's a, it's a skill for sure. Well, why don't you, uh, you know, I just noticed behind there, <laughs> it's hey, a perfect Euro nymphing that run. That is a Euro nymphing run if I've ever seen one. So let's go down there and let's show everybody how you do this lob cast. Let's give it a shot. Well, let's see this casting technique and how it relates to fishing. This is a perfect situation where, where you have advantages over a strike indicator, I, I feel, because mm -hmm. you're, you can move a lot faster, you can cover more water, and you can, you can get the fly to where the fish are faster, okay, because you're not necessarily setting up your indicator with men's and things like that. I have very little line out of the end of the rod. I'm changing it a little bit for this situation, but, and the cast I'm going to make is a lob, and you really don't have a lot. You're just basically lobbing the weight of your flies, either in a backhanded cast, depending on which side of the river you're on, or you can do it from the side too and flip it over that way. You can add as much as 20, 30, 40 feet of line depending on how good you are at the lob, but I'm going to stick with something real basic here. So let me demonstrate this a little it's bit. It's also good when you have a lot of brush behind you too. It's a great technique for anything. It's not just if you're in Europe fishing for grayling. I no. mean, you can use this for, for almost anything and it has been used for, you know, for 50 plus years. You gotta have tension before you can load the rod to lob, lob right. it up. It's, it's just key, you can't pick up a slack line. Just like the roll cast. Exactly. Tension of the water. So I'm gonna flip it over. This is actually an easy lob right here. Yep. And I'm just Euro nymphing right now. Yeah, you're slightly pulling the nymph, just a little bit faster than the current. Right, uh, and, and you'll see it looks strange. It looks like, hey, there's drag on that fly. Yep. Well, it's, that's on purpose. Yep. Um, because basically you're in touch with the flies, right. with, with what you're fishing. You're gonna feel a strike. You're going to get 80% of the strikes, or 80% of the takes, you're going to get a chance to hook them. Where on an indicator, you may only get 30 or 40% of the takes. You see how I kind of do a big windmill? Yep. I'm actually loading it from out here and flipping it around. Pete, I've noticed you just fished the closer water, and then what do you keep adding line and going out farther, right? Yeah, it's one of the options that you can do with your own nymphing is you can actually add a little line to each cast and work your way out, especially if you can't access it. Okay, so what, let's see some longer casts. Okay, let me add a little line on the next one here. Okay. Okay, notice you're raising your rod up right here. You're giving it a little pull there at the end. Yep. Raising the rod up. See how I shot a little line? And yep. you can certainly just lob it over to add your line too that way. And now I'm fishing an extra 15 feet. I gotta add, pull. Pull my line in a little, but there we go. It's just bumping right on the bottom, isn't it? Yep. And your cast is so important that you have it upstream. Okay, again, you're just throwing in a men when you make that cast. There you go, reaching out. Now, if you did an overhead cast, not only would the uh, flies come crashing into the rod, but uh, they would not be at that same angle, would they? Exactly, that's a great point right there. You got a lot of options with this, with this lob right here. Not to mention, look how fast I can fish if I'm moving up this area right here. Yep. I can just cover this, lead with it a little. You're really covering the water better than any other method. Because each, each time you can add six inches and move out. Really a terrific nymphing technique. Also, you can, uh, you can let it swing on the, on the downswing. And of course, uh, with the heavy flies that you put on, there's no need of sinking lines. You're getting right on the bottom. Right, and I use a smaller diameter tippet. What a lot of anglers don't realize that 
sinking lines and fast streams just really don't help you. Oh, and you There's got a fish. Net. Hey. And you bring them in, slide yep. them on in. Yep. A little brown trout. Well, that might even have counted in the world championships. This is a probably what eight inch, seven inch fish. Seven inch fish. Seven, they uh, they go by centimeters over there. Yep. But you know you would have never felt that fish with an indicator, would you? That's the that's the beauty of a technique like this with a lob. The, the you know the Europeans figured it out is that I'm in full contact with my flies. And you know and I this... felt that guy and just kind of set him and, and brought him in and and you can see how how close you are to the fish as well, which is nice because. You don't play out a lot of fish. You know, you can you can you can basically hurt a fish by playing them out from a long distance. That's why you can bring them in, release them, get them on their way pretty quick. It's just a great technique. Now, longer rod. A lot of the Europeans will use rods up to even 12 feet. Yeah, they will. And it, basically, what it does is it gives you more reach. Um, one of the secrets to this to Euro nymphing is uh, staying in certain water columns or certain feeding lanes. Actually, mm -hmm. I should say this is the columns. This is the lanes this way and you can really control that if you're underneath the tip of your rod. And so let's say that you can't wade any further or you don't want to approach the fish. Well, with a 10-foot rod, you get an extra foot or so, and that's why, that's why they do that. And they'll, they'll go all the way down to four foot, or four weight 10, yeah. four weight 10 foots, exactly. One thing I want to, before we uh, leave this, is to, to uh, understand that uh, this technique, while the hallmark of competition fishing, is really a terrific way of fishing when it, the fishing gets tough, especially cold weather uh, and climate conditions. And the indicator fishing just isn't something that you could fish for in here. Now what I'm gonna do right now is go with the, uh, the big stuff. And uh, one, of the, one of the problems that we have uh, with casting streamers or woolly buggers or anything is that we have a couple situations that can happen, and that is split shot. Pete, how many times have you seen a split shot or a conehead fly or something hit a rod and shatter it? It's one of the most common ways to break a rod. And one of the things that I've found is a new way of fishing and taking uh, the split shot away. Now, if you're in Yellowstone Park, you can't use lead. A lot of places you can't. And this replacement tin isn't all that heavy. Right, right. Exactly, and it's not a good option in, in, in a lot of situations where you need to get it down. And what I've done is, again, we've, we've spent a lot of time in Europe, Pete and I, with the World Fly Fishing Championships, and a lot of people ask, what have they done for us in the fly fishing? What has competition done for us? Well, one of the things that brought us uh, bead-headed nymphs. Yeah. The Belgian team introduced us when they... Gold heads. Lead. They yeah. call them gold heads. Yeah, the gold heads. But what they've uh, given to us is sinking leaders. This is a poly leader. A lot of different brands out there, and essentially this is about two split shot. Two split shot, now it's dark, it's hard for you to see that, and you can get them in different weights. This happens to be a six, one of the heavier ones. Mm -hmm. You can get them in intermediate, which just means just a little under, like maybe one split shot. Right. This is not going to break my rod, and, it, and I can use a shorter leader. I, I attach to that just some monofilament line here. Well, this is, makes it a lot easier to cast. If you start casting a streamer and you got a nine foot leader, you're going to have a problem. Oh, absolutely. And I have this attached to an intermediate tip line. And I want to show you some of the cast with streamer fishing using this wonderful uh, uh, leader. It's going to be easier to cast in about three split shots. And I've got a heavy fly on here. This is a, a cone-headed kiwi muddler right here. That's a, <laughs> that's a great streamer. That's a weapon, though. It is. It is. It's heavy. It's heavy. <laughs> So uh, let's take a look at some of these casts by going out here. We've got a couple good spots here. One of the things that, uh, that you'll find with your streamer cast, Pete, and you do a lot of it, mm -hmm. is most of the time you're going to be going across and downstream. It's almost the same technique of your European nymphing. We're going to pull the fly with the current. Again, why? So you stay in contact with your fly. Yeah. Boy, you said the word, contact, mm -hmm. staying in contact. And we want it to also imitate right, it, the minnow. It helps it swim. There's no way those minnows are going to swim up this stream, are they? No, not this part of the session <laughs> right here. Okay, now the first thing you're going to realize is that casting uh, a big heavy fly, is, false casting is not something that's going to be uh, in the uh, program. If you're going to do something like this, you've got to wait for that fly to straighten out and you've got to put more energy in this back cast. Again, it's like throwing the indicators. We're going to increase the energy, we're going to deepen the loop, 
by putting more energy in that cache. We're going to come up and stop and point into the loop. Well, Pete, you know the important thing, again, no false casting. This roll cast pickup comes incredibly important on the streamer fishing because if you pick this fly up like this, Oh, I noticed it. it has your name on it, doesn't yeah. it? I'm just built to uh, duck that thing. So it's what we're going to do is accelerate it up, come back up like this. Notice the trees behind us here. Mm -hmm. yeah, if I got, go right here, whoops, I got, got problem. good brush right behind us right now. So what we're going to do is that we're going to change our casting angle. Instead of, again, right here, we're going to almost tell ourselves we're going to go up. We're going to increase more energy here. We're actually pointing into the loop. Pointing into the loop so when that fly comes up, you're actually straight in line with the fly. Oh, oh yeah, that, I can see where that would be effective in this situation right here. We're straight in line with the fly. Here we go. And then we come down, we pull down on the rod. Again, that pull down cast. And as you get really good at casting these streamers, what you'll even do is be able to do a downstream mend in it. Now, when I cast here, I reach out. Now, we got a downstream mend and we've been going upstream mend. Well, a lot of people are confused on that one. They're saying, whoa, whoa, wait, wait, you can mend downstream too? Of course you can. Because what do we want the streamer to do? We want it to swim downstream. Exactly. Right now it's swimming downstream and I'm giving it a little action and working it back across. It's going to swing back across. Our cast is incredibly important. Now, here we go. We're going to use our roll cast. Now, say if you have it right here, mm -hmm. watch how we do with our roll cast. We're going to pump it up in the air, come back, shoot the line over, follow it with our rod tip, strip it back, and again, keep it in contact. Right. And when you get really good at this, the more you do it, you're going to find you do the same thing what you did. I lobbed it over there, and I picked it up without even doing a roll cast. Mm -hmm. Your lob cast is uh, important in streamer fishing, too. Now. I'm going to try to, I, what I try to do when I fish a streamer, I like, I, I see brown trout laying in on, under there. So I'm going to increase my cast. Spot. Again, I'm going to go up here, back up, and across, keeping in contact. And another cast I'm going to do, again, I'm going to roll cast it out. I'm not so worried about spooking the fish. Boom, hitting it over and letting that current pull it back around. There we go, back around now. You know, we've talked about streamers, but you know there's another thing you use a lot is woolly buggers. Oh yeah. And dead drifting, I same fish them type in nymphs, of thing. Yeah, I fish them in a nymphing style all the time. This sinking leader, yep. woolly bugger on there, and we're gonna again do the same type of thing, almost like your lob over like this, and now we're gonna keep a rod high and let it dead drift down, same thing what a split shot would do. Again, keeping a little loop of line, mm -hmm. and a lot of times I'll have a little loop right here, and then and I can actually feel when the fish takes, boom. Yep, and you're yeah. in contact with it. Also, holding your rod up gives you a little more access a little further. You can see that just waiting right here, I mean, you got one foot in the grave and one on a, the other one on a banana peel, right? <laughs> when, when you, if you're out in the middle of that stuff. So just elevating the rod also gives you a little more reach. Again, I'm gonna do the same thing, again, Back out, up, around, cast, high rod tip. Steelhead fishermen do this mm -hmm. an awful lot. Yep. Downstream stream swing. That downstream swing is a very popular. And again, being able to come out of this so that you can get your line moving back and through again. The main thing, I think if I could tell all of you out there is you can't bring that rod back like this. The more you bring it back, you've got to re learn to bring it up rather than back because nothing's worse, and we've all been there, you've been in a drift mm -hmm. boat when this has happened, is to have this cast go right back and hit you in the back of the head because yep. it's coming at this angle. And, it, and I'll tell you, all it takes is one time. Yeah, and a lot of the, a lot of the re results from too wide of a casting arc, which is what you're talking about, is the whole chuck and duck phenomenon because it's it's coming through. That's if right. You open, if you have too wide of a casting arc for this type of situation, it's going to cause you trouble. I mean, Again, bring that rod tip up, bring that rod tip up, pull down, and this is where a haul comes in. When I come in, watch, I pull down, and that can shoot the line. Again, back up, pull down, shoot the line. 
Streamer fishing can be quite fun, especially if you don't hit yourself in the head. And One of my favorite flies is a kiwi muddler. And I've changed that a little bit and added a cone head and added a few little twists to make this fly a lot better. One of the things I love to do with streamers, that is fish at night. Yes, night. And I like to fish early in the morning. Now, a lot of people think you want to use a white fly for that. Not true. Black works better. Why? Contrast. Fish can still see light at night. And they, it's almost like a washed out color for them. And that black will really have contrast and show up. So I'm going to tie a black kiwi, one of my favorite uh, cloudy day or night flies. So let's get started with the cone head kiwi. Now, first of all, you can see that I have a cone uh, already put on that. And now you can get cones in different colors. You can get tungsten cones. Uh, I've got the, now the tungsten are a little bit more money, but uh, uh, they're also a little denser and a little heavier. Now notice the different sizes here. That brass is a lot smaller. Now I'm, I'm doing a size four, so I'm gonna tie a bigger cone, a large cone. Now, I'm going to seat that cone first by tying a little bit of thread right by the eye. See, I'm wrapping some thread. Now, the thread I use on this fly is a, a rod wrapping thread, a G a good broid. I found that to be the best uh, for working with hair. And uh, it, it packs very, really, very nicely. Now, I'm working that up. You might say, why am I doing that? Well, I want it to seat in there. So not only when I'm tying it, it doesn't wiggle, but also it'll, say, it'll stay in there when we're fishing it, too. Now, I can just put a little half hitch, and if I wanted to, I could just do a little uh, whip finish, too. Now, if you have a whip finisher, if you don't do a hand whip finish, that's fine, too. But uh, that'll work out well. And actually, that, that cone will be pushed in right over it, and you won't really have to worry about it. Uh, now, we're going to start with some lead. I always like to have my kiwis leaded, and I'm going to guarantee you this will seek. Now, if you don't put this lead on, and you decide you want it close to the surface, then what I do is just build up uh, some yarn, uh, and you'll see why, because it's important. Uh, the yarn will help fill out the flashable tubing body. Now, let's get started. I, notice that I have my lead uh, on a spool. And I just wrap uh, off a bulk spool onto these little fly tying thread uh, spools, and ah, we're ready to go. I don't, I don't get an expensive bobbin for this either, because they're kind of hard on bobbins. Now I'm going to start just around here about where the uh, uh, barb is, and then I'm going to come forward. Now notice it's wrapping nice and easy. And it, it's just a great way of wrapping lead. It keeps your fingers from turning black. Now I'm going to guesstimate about three quarters of the way down the shank because I need room here to tie on our, our wing and our head because it's going to be a muddler sculpin type head. Now I'm, I'm taking my thumbnail and pushing down the lead. Now if I think I need more lead, and it's hard to get some of the thicker lead at times, and I can do, I, I want to push it together like this, maybe wrap another couple wraps. Now I'm going to go back over that. Look at this. And we'll have a double layer. But the nice thing about it, it really gets in tight and it won't move on you. There we go. And it's actually better than if we had one great big chunk of lead on there. It'll be in there much tighter. And we're just coming to the back here. And just about there, just as we get there, we're going to pull it down. Use our scissors like a lance. Lead's hard on scissors. Notice I have a heavy duty, it's an anvil scissor. Uh, you don't want to have, uh, when you're tying a lot of lead and copper, you want to have a scissor that's really strong, and this certainly does it, because it will wear them out. Now, I'm going to go to another material that, uh, this is called soft wire by UniThreads, made in Canada, and this happens to be a small size to go all the way up to large. Now, I'm using the small size, and I'm going to wrap it right at the bend of the hook, right behind the lead and just wrap over it just like tying thread. Again, use it as a lance. I'm going to make sure that I cover that up. Now, we're going to stop it right there, and we're going to get some flashaboo tubing. Now, this flashaboo tubing is going to be pearlescent, and I need a large. You can try a medium. Sometimes a mediums will go over, but you got to go over that cone, and that takes a little bit uh, larger 
tubing. Now I'm going to pull it to the back, and then once I get it to the back, I'm going to then tie it down. Notice that I'm using it just like tying thread. I'm tying it down very tight. Now well, we knew the Kiwis had a little bit of a problem with this body. It sure is a you know, great imitation of the belly of a minnow, but boy, a brown trout's teeth would just rip it apart. But now we add this little ribbing through here, and it really adds to the durability of the fly. It has a nice color uh, variation to it also. Notice I'm going right through that, just like I was ribbing it with thread, and uh, we have a nice uh, uh, minnow-like body. And I'm trimming it out. Now, if you're up right up against that cone, you're going to be too close. Now, you've got to be careful of that. And there we go. Now, at this point, I'm going to uh, take my tying thread that I had before, and what we're going to do is wrap over that. Oh, typical fly tie. I've already, my flying tying bench lost my thread. Oh, there we go. Now we're going to wrap over that copper wire. Actually, it's not really copper. It's kind of a reddish. And there's about five different colors this uh, wire comes in. And we're going to trim. Now we're ready to add something that I really like. You may not have uh, seen this in any of my videos because this is something new. And we're going to add uh, kind of a bleeding gills or blood coming off the fly. Now, uh, a friend of mine in Canada who ties pike flies gave me this idea. that He puts it on all his pike flies and it adds it right to the side. And when we first started tying it, we called it the bleeding heart kiwi, but uh, since we've just incorporated into the regular kiwi, uh, it's now what I'm putting on here is uh, it's a uh, Rabbit. It's a thin little zonker strip of dyed red rabbit. You can use orange, a burnt orange, kind of up to you. But I, I like the red, especially with the black here. It's a nice contrast. Now I'm tying it on the side, so it's just like gills. Or it could be like peck fins, but we're going to have the, the peck fins are going to come from the hair. Now we've tied that in, and we're ready to go. Let me just tilt that where you can kind of see that. Now we're going to add the wing. Now the wing is uh, quite uh, unique the way we cut it. Now what I've done is taken some dyed rabbit. We haven't seen too many black rabbits running around at night. So we have got a dyed rabbit strip. Now this is going to be darker. Now of course on the regular kiwis I use brown, I use gray brown, I use chinchilla, a lot of different colors for my kiwis. The idea is good movement up and down. And we're going to tie this down using our thumbnail, so it's right on top. Now, where did we get it from? We got it from a rabbit strip right here. And how did I trim it? I can take an X-Acto knife and trim it that way. If you take a scissor, you've got to make very short little cuts. And I'll usually do it just about like this. I'll just do it real quickly here. That's the kind of shape that you want to have. I think it's kind of hard to see that black, but I think it's, it's minnow shaped. Thin up here, uh, and then comes out wide and right on to the back there. Okay, so now we're going to add a little bit of, uh, we can add some things to it to kind of add some uh, uh, coloration. We could use uh, pearlescent flash of blue. I like flash of blue over crystal flash for this fly. It seems to work a little bit better. And when I talk to other anglers, uh, I get the same impression that uh, everybody likes uh, flash of blue. Now, I even have some red flash of blue here. We can put this on, just kind of give it a little little accent here. Ugh. I hate to say it, but <laughs> I'm allergic to rabbit. Uh, but I like tying with it. I, now, why would anybody allergic to rabbit tie with it? It just works too darn good. Now, I'm just going to get a few of these fibers and tie it in, right, just right up on top. And we'll trim them. Don't need very many, just a few. have to give it a little, little bit of a touch. And if you want to add a little of the pearlescent. I, I find this pearlescent just so, in, so I want to say insect-like, and it really isn't insect-like, it's minnow-like. A little bit more sparkle to it. Now, if I'm fishing uh, in the fall, maybe for some spawning brown trout or before the spawn starts, I'll take out some of that flash. I might do an all-black body. I might also add 
uh, some of the uh, short flash chenille in black, just to change the color so it's not as bright. One thing we notice in the fall that they don't quite like as bright of kiwis. Now we're ready to tie in uh, the head. Now one of the reasons I designed the kiwi muddler is that I wanted a, a uh, scoping pattern you could tie uh, within uh, you know, eight, six to eight minutes. Some of you might be able to tie this in five minutes. I, the regular key without the cone head can be tied in five minutes. Now, if you think of some of the real big sculpting patterns, real intricate ones, you'd be lucky to tie it in 15 or 20 minutes, and you're not going to want to throw it very close to a brush pile. So that's one of the reasons why we designed the Kiwi. Okay, here we go. I'm coming in from the side. I've got a nice bunch of dyed black. How, how much should you have measured against the gape? And you could add some cement at this time. Uh, for the sake of speed, we're not going to do that, but just add it right in here. And I'm going to take that point and line up my tips right there. Now watch with my thumb. I'm going to spread it out tight, tighter, tightest. Now, you notice that it didn't spin. I like to call this flaring instead of spinning. I'm going to do the same thing on the other side. Now, make sure when you tie this in that you tie it close to that wing for the first two. You're actually going to put four clumps in here. We're going to come around to the other side. We're going to line it up again, just the same way. Line it up with the, that point. And we're going to take our two fingers, separate it, and tight. We're going to do the same thing, tight, tighter, tightest. Now, what I'm doing is I'm throwing some thread and I'm pulling it back towards me like that. Now, you're going to say, wait a minute, aren't you right on this cone? Well, you're really not. Look at that. You're not on that. You've got to put some more hair so it's compacted. Otherwise, it's going to slide around. So we're going to take a little bit more. This can get a little tricky. I'll tell you why. These cones are known to cut leaders if you don't get something right and tight to it. Okay, here we go. Now, one of the questions might be asked is, could you change the colors there? Could I add a different color? Well, of course. You could make a multicolored sculpin head, and that, that's actually a good thing to do. Now I'm going to go back on the other side and put a little bit more. you got to do that, otherwise you have big uh, holes in your, your sculpin type head. You might say, gosh, are they black sculpins? You know something about sculpins? They can change color in a matter of seconds to match their surroundings. So uh, they, uh, they can change colors. And if the surroundings are dark, they become dark. But you know, why does a woolly bugger work? Well, a lot of it's the action, and that's what uh, this fly is, and the contrast. Best color in woolly bugger is black. Again, great color. Now at this point, we're really kind of finished except for trimming. Now you could take your uh, Mattarelli whip finish, and do it like that around there. But I prefer, if you, if you can, try to do it by hand. And I find that to work the best. All you got to do is slip in here and get under that cone. I'm pulling back on the hair, and I can uh, slip it in right underneath the cone, or the, uh, the hair, right? The cone is right up against that hair. And it's a little tricky at first. Oh, that darn rabbit just got my nose going there. All right, I never remember to take my allergy medicine when I tie these flies. There we go. Now I trim that. Now we're going to also put in some cement. And when we put the cement, we're going to drop it so it goes right in underneath that comb. And I do that with the bodkin. Dip into the cement and then put it right around there. Now we're ready to uh, trim this fly out. Oh, I, I, this, this is another thing that drives me crazy. I'm also allergic to deer hair. but. Man, you just can't be a fly tire without deer hair. All those years of tying humpies and sneezing, I never knew what was going on. Okay, now, what we're going to do, we're going to hold it up right here, and we're going to cut underneath it first. And I pretty much take off all the collar. I want some of the collar in the fly, and that's the collar right there, because I want it to act like a little uh, fin, a uh, peck fin. Now I'm going to go up to the top and trim on top. Notice that I'm turning it so I can see, and I'm kind of going at an angle like this. Now, you're not going to get your big sculpin head with these cone heads uh, quite like you would if you didn't have the cone head on there. And uh, uh, it's not really that, that bad a thing. It's mainly the, the whole contour of the fly, especially this black one, which is, uh, really could go for other fish besides uh, just sculpin. 
Again, we're trying to invoke a response. Now, fish take streamers for two reasons. Obviously, they think it's a minnow to eat, or the other reason is like a spinning lure. It just makes them mad. It violates their territory, and fish protect their territory. The bigger the fish, the more they protect their territory. Uh, consequently, streamers catch big fish. It's surprising, though, because even little fish want to eat uh, meadows, gets good protein, and, and they get a little bit bigger. Notice I'm rotating it, blowing the hair as I trim it. Ooh, it's, a, it's really in your face. Now, the obvious thing might be, should I use uh, a razor blade? Now, razor blades work really well. You just kind of bend them over, and you can just cut this in a matter of minutes. Uh, I do a lot of traveling, and razor blades don't travel very well. But I'll tell you one of the things that I got away from it is just having young kids when I first started tying these flies around. They always seem to get into the razor blade. So be careful if you do use a rubber blade. Now what I've done now is shaped it. And you'll be able to kind of shape it the way you want it. It's kind of a cone shape right now, just like the cone that's on it. And you can see it's a killer fly. It's going to get wet. It's going to pump in the water. And it's going to work very well for you. Again, this is the conehead kiwi. One of my favorite ones is the yellow one with the gray body. Also, I like uh, uh, a gray with the gray deer hair, brown and uh, gray with the brown. Kind of up to you. Always work great, too.